Well, it is November 1st, 2023. In many cultures, it is the Day of the Dead. And this is the death card from Tarot of Ceremonial Magic. He's pushing his, uh, his Tau shaped, his uh, capital T shaped uh, lawnmower there. And got a few crudely drawn hands and feet and things. But anyway, that's our cute little death card. I really like the, the Clefotic uh, sigil there. There's the king, king death there. I think there's got a crown on his head and everything else. Well, anyway, uh, I've got a Day of the Dead uh, little thing I'm going to uh, share with you just briefly. But uh, Perhaps it appears that I'm overdressed uh, for being in the house. It's pretty chilly here in the house today. Uh, not only that, but Constance uh, is encouraging me to have this under my sweatshirt. Now, this is what we call a puppy. Okay, it used to be... Uh, uh, pant leg of of some jeans that I wore for many years so it's it's got a talismanically charged fabric here and she hands sews it into a little bag like this and the top of the bag is is open and inside is another bag okay and this one is made of like linen and it's hand sewn too, and it contains rice. And this rice bag inside this other bag here, we call a puppy. And we put the puppy in the microwave. We have a microwave in the pantry area of our bedroom. We don't ever cook food in our microwave. That's unnatural. But we do what we call nuke our puppies, especially at bedtime on these chilly, chilly days. So I nuked my puppy to talk about death. <laughs> but anyway, it's cold in here and I'm going to put my nuked puppy on my lap. Does that paint quite a picture? <laughs> oh, it feels so nice. Anyway, it, I, it really it really works and and um, no puppies are harmed. No dogs are harmed when we nuke our puppies. Anyway, briefly, I hope you had a great Halloween. Uh, it was a very busy neighborhood last night here in uh, East Sacramento. Uh, we live right next door to a, a beautiful, charming uh, 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 Lutheran or Lutheran slash Methodist uh, uh, church just right next door uh, or across the next door across the alley. And uh, they had tables set up and everything else. And uh, uh, our neighbors across the street have sort of a thing that they've done for, for years and years out, out in front. And they set up their chairs and it's so, it's so sweet. It really is. Uh, it's not as, as wild and carefree as Halloween's where Constance and I were, were talking about it because we grew up in the same town uh, together and did the same kid things uh, at the same time. Uh, it was kind of Id ideal. Sometimes it, it was so cold it froze even. And a couple times I think it even snowed. But uh, we would go out with with uh, pillowcases 
and we'd go as far as we could walk in one direction and hit every house. And some of the houses invited us in for cocoa and and uh, uh, homemade things, popcorn balls and and things things like that. And we'd just pack those pillowcases and then come back home, dump our candy, empty our pillowcases, and then go in the opposite direction. And uh, there wasn't any, we people weren't setting fire to cars or anything else. It's just other kids just dressed up in, in uh, homemade hobo costumes. And it was just so sweet. And uh, this year, uh, come, walking back from the coffee shop uh, early last evening, there were girls, I guess uh, Barbie was the big, <laughs> big costume, which is pretty cool. Uh, but uh, it, it, I enjoy Halloween. I enjoy it a lot uh, back in Costa Mesa. Uh, where some of our neighbors were in the movie industry, and they, they just set up a full, a full-blown pirate ship. I mean, yeah, pirate ship. You walk up and in it, things like that. Uh, so I, I'm happy Halloween has become a, a big thing. And uh, a few years ago, when the the movie Coco came out, the Disney uh, animated musical uh, that focused on the Day of the Dead and uh, is as corny and as Disney-esque as, as it was. Uh, I think it was a very important motion picture uh, uh, culturally uh, because the Day of the Dead is, you know, it's something it, it's a universal thing uh, that at this time of year uh, everybody seems inclined to not let their honored dead be forgotten. It's almost like uh, an unspoken duty as as if they want to be remembered even more than you're inclined to remember them and now's the time to do it uh, so anyway i have uh, i know probably all of us have some kind of story to tell uh one way or another today i put up a picture of my mother and father in uh, taken in 1940 uh, when they got married, and of my dear brother, dearly departed brother Mark. Uh, so those are those are my uh, Day of the Dead. Uh, but you know we've got eighty billion people in our past that we've forgotten. But anyway. Uh, I'm going to share one little little story for today, and uh, and it's from from the book My Life with the Spirits. Now, of everything that I've written, and I wrote My Life with the Spirits is one of my first first books. Uh, it is in My Life with the Spirits paperback. It's in, of course in Kindle, and it's an audio book. And uh, the the narrator, because uh, I, I had the chance to, to so we'll all narrate it myself. But no, I I enjoy hearing someone else someone else read it. And uh, the narrator is John uh, uh, Waters, uh, not the director, but the the, the vocal uh, artist. Uh, and I just love it. I just love it. So we've got uh, the paperback, the Kindle, the audio book, and the audio book uh, uh, CD. It's probably, 
and this is written like in 1993 or something. It's a pretty old book, but it, uh, I'm happy to say it's still it's still out there, and I'm still very proud of it. And I've got a chapter. Uh, I think it's chapter 11. That it's called. Let's see here. My father's ghost. If I can find it. Wizard of Tequilma, California Dreamin', Holy Communion, seven, eight, nine. Well, I was wrong. It's not in. <laughs> Here it is. My Father's Ghost, Chapter Eleven. Gotta readjust my puppy. Most everyone would agree that objective reality is a world where living things are just that, living things, such as people or dogs or cats or elephants. Furthermore, symbols are not alive, but they're abstract representation of ideas. It's been my experience, however, that the, the opposite is true on the magical plane. Symbols are alive. And living things are generally symbols for something. When I see an angel or a magical beast in a dream or vision or scrying session, it's usually a symbolic encounter with a concept concerning a personal or magical issue that is too complex to be expressed or understood through any other medium. These same living apparitions react to symbols as if they were alive. A simple geometric figure such as a cross or a pentagram drawn in the air in the face of a pesky spirit is often enough to send it fleeing in terror. This basic rule of thumb unravels when one is faced in a dream or a vision with the living image of a dead person. Is it alive or is it a symbol? Almost everyone who's ever lost a loved one has at least one visitation story to tell. Usually the deceased appears in a vivid dream or vision a week or two after dying and delivers a message to the effect that everything's okay and not to worry. I used to think that this phenomenon was a natural denial mechanism of the mind, triggered at times when it's easier to accept an hallucination rather than dealing with grief and the, the great mystery of death. Now I'm not so sure. I was 24 when my dad died of emphysema. A few weeks after seeing Jean-Paul take his first steps, he was only 61. About 10 days after his funeral, he showed up to deliver a curious message. Since my initiation into Amork, or that's the uh, uh, Rosicrucian Order Amork, uh, ancient and mysterious uh, Ordo Rosae Crucis, Crucis uh, Amork, they advertise in popular mechanics and things like that, or they did in my day. And I was a member of Amork. Uh, as a matter of fact, it, it, it sort of broke the hymen of mysticism for me. It was my my opening uh, 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 in, encounter with 
occult orders and things like that. Since my initiation into Amork, I had set aside an hour or two each Thursday night to study the monographs and practice the various outlined psychic exercises. For some reason, I decided this night I would perform my devotions before dinner and set up my sanctum altar in the bedroom. I opened the temple with the usual ceremonial formalities, unsealed my new monograph, and started to read. Almost immediately, I found that I could not keep my mind focused on the words. I found myself reading the same sentence over and over again until I became extremely sleepy. I finally gave up trying to read altogether and decided to take a nap before dinner and pick up my studies later. I blew out both candles, the, the sort of uh, setup that you, that you do. Uh, being an old yogi, I did all my stuff on the floor. Uh, so I had a, uh, a step an antique step that Constance and I had uh, salvaged from a, a house, an old house that is being torn down, and uh, I used that step as an as an altar. We st we still have it, um, and I had set up a a mirror uh, behind that step, and then two candles uh, on uh, on either side of my reflection, and there's a little altar cloth. It's, it's really cool. And uh, uh, you light the candles and you do your meditations in front of, they call it a telesterion. But I digress. I blew out both candles and stretched out in the cool darkness. In those days, it was my habit when sleeping on my back to cross my arms over my breast. I closed my eyes and was instantly out. Suddenly, I mean, it was suddenly, it just sort of, I was out like that and then, then I wasn't. Suddenly I became conscious that the room was no longer dark. I remember thinking that I'd broken the very first safety rule of fledgling mystics and allowed myself to fall asleep with candles burning. Kids, don't do that at home. You may go into more dimensions than you're ready to, to go into. Fiery dimensions. Don't go to sleep with your candles burning. I opened my eyes and looked up at the ceiling. I could see every detail bathed in a warm orange light. Then I noticed that my arms were no longer crossed over my chest, but stretched out crucifixion style. That struck me as being very curious because I knew I hadn't been asleep long enough to change positions. The pit of my stomach tingled. Remember, I was talking about astral projection the other day, how the, the first time I jumped off of a, a three meter uh, diving board into a swimming pool, how I f felt that intense, almost ecstatic tingling in the pit of my stomach, the, the same feeling you get when you allow yourself to just sort of relax as uh, your jet airplane is taking off and you, it's like you're being stretched out of your body. The pit of my the pit of my stomach tingled with the joyous thrill I always feel when I dream of flying. But I wasn't flying. I was flat on my back on the bed. I turned my head to the left and looked down my arm to see my hand dangling over the mattress. Then I turned my then I turned to the right and to my utter delight discovered my father sitting by the bed, not six inches from my hand. He looked great. 
Better, in fact, than I'd seen him in years. I felt younger just looking at him. His skin was a beautiful tan and his hair was thicker and darker than I ever remembered. He didn't say a word. And for some reason, I wasn't inclined to speak either. We just looked at each other. I soon became conscious of the peculiarity of the moment. The light in the room did not come from the candles or the electric lights, but seemed to radiate from every object in the room, most especially from Dad and me. And there was a tangible silence in the room, as if the whole world was holding its breath. I had the feeling that if anything were to move, it would do so in blissfully slow motion. And then finally it dawned on me. I was sleeping. Dad was dead. And all this was very weird indeed. I had the presence of mind to realize that the thrill in the pit of my stomach was symptomatic of astral projection, and that this whole experience might not be a dream at all, but a bona fide case of psychic contact with the dead. To test my theory, I willed myself to float slowly up to the ceiling and back down again. I did it with ease. I looked over at Dad and smiled, and he seemed amused, but a little impatient. Like, what the fuck are you doing that for? What are you doing? Then, with great deliberation, he lifted his right hand. He wore a beautiful golden ring with a blue stone setting. The stone was embellished with the Masonic square and compass. However, upon closer examination, I saw that superimposed upon the square was a downward-pointing triangle surmounted by an onk, very, very similar to the device, the Amorc device, or the Amorc symbol. Is that your message? I, I asked mentally. He smiled and just pointed to the ring. I had no idea what that meant. He delivered the wordless message with such drama and grace that for the time being, I, did, I didn't care what it meant. It was just a beautifully pleasant moment. I choked up a little like I do when I almost cry at the movies. I closed my eyes just for an instant to control the tears. I took a deep breath, then opened my eyes. The room was dark. My arms were folded over my chest. And my father was gone. A week or so later, Constance and I visited Aunt Vina. That's, his, that's Dad's sister, his older sister. My father's sister in Long Beach. I mentioned to her that I was studying the Amorc monographs, and she said, in that case, I've got something for you. She went to her bookcase and plucked several very old Amorc books and some bound monographs from the 1930s. She said, I took the lessons for about five years, she said as she handed me the books. You're welcome to these old monographs, too. Your father tried to join when he was 17 or 18. But in those days, you had to be 21 years old to join the Rosicrucians. He was heartbroken. He was so thrilled when the Masons accepted him about the time you were born. So he joined the Masons in 1948. This little tidbit of family history did not exactly 
explain my father's visitation, but at the time it served to encourage me concerning the direction my spiritual life was heading. However, the years to follow, when the mysteries of Rosicrucianism and esoteric Freemasonry would become the centerpiece of my magical life. I would come to understand that the message of my father's ghost was uncannily prophetic. So that's chapter 11 of My Life with the Spirits. Uh, of course, I encourage you to, to get it. I, getting up. Oh, it feels so good on my cold neck. Oh, geez. Get yourself a puppy and cuddle up with it. Anyway, thank you for joining me in this cozy moment. Until tomorrow, continue to be good to yourself, be good to each other. Think about someone dead. They might be thinking about you. Love is a law. Love under will.